All right, this is second service. It is July 11th, 2021. I'm Jason Tripp. If your Bible is turned to Acts chapter number 22, please. Acts chapter number 22. We're going to go through Paul's defense here that he gives uh, as a result of being uh, bound and then taken by the Roman soldiers. Uh, the Roman soldiers are uh, questioning him about who he was, what he was supposed to do. Uh, there was uh, obviously a, a huge uproar. All in Jerusalem were beating him. And when the centurions came, uh, they all, uh, those that were beating him, ran away. And, and, and uh, then, of course, they're trying to figure out what he, what he did. And uh, in verse number 22, uh, chapter 22, you know, he's trying to say, can I please have an opportunity to please speak to my people? We remember the reason why the Apostle Paul went to Jerusalem. It's because he has this great heaviness, continual sorrow in his heart for his brethren, for his kinsmen after his flesh. He wishes that they could be saved, and uh, he, he's willing to lose his own life. He says that. He goes, I don't know what's going to befall me, but I'm not only ready to be bound, but I'm also ready to die You know, for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't care. He doesn't count his life dear unto him, right? He wants to finish his course with joy and testify and this is what we're seeing now we're seeing the testimony uh, before the nation of israel and then we're in the next couple passages and chapters we will see that fulfillment of the prophecy of the testifying before the kings the authority and the leadership so in chapter number 22 uh he, he beseeches please please he, he wants to speak into the people finally they say okay go ahead he, he gets up on he gets the license he stood up on the stairs he beckons with the hand of the people and when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, and he says the following information. So this is very important. Okay? It needs to be reflected that when Christ was brought before the kings, he opened not his mouth. Right. Very specifically, Christ repeatedly tells Pilate, you say that I am. Right. The testimony that he did was done by the mouth of the Jews and what they had said. Yeah. Do you not realize that you have the power, you know, I have the power to free you? And remember he says, you have no power but if you've given a view of God. And we looked at those verses last week in Romans chapter 13. Mm -hmm. But this, this issue of Christ being silent and giving a defense versus Paul giving his defense with actual language, right, if you would, his defense here is, is the time. It's the time for us to speak. So he says here, my, my men and brethren, fathers, hear my defense which I make unto you and when they heard that he spake notice this in the Hebrew tongue to them they kept them more silent interesting because if you look over here in uh, verse chapter 21 and verse 37 when Paul says he speaks with the tongues multiple tongues mm -hmm. he speaks in the Hebrew here and then in a second over here notice what it says in verse 37 who said canst thou speak Greek so he obviously knew Greek as well he had multiple languages by which he could speak. Amazing when you hear people speak multiple languages. Uh, uh, there's a, what a gift. I mean, there's polygots. You can sit there and speak multiple, multiple languages and go in and out of it. And I remember one of the interviews I watched, and they said, what are you thinking? And the guy's like, yeah, it's really weird. I don't, I, I think in this, I usually think in this language. I think, like if their inner voice thinks in one particular language, uh, and it may not necessarily be their, their absolute primary language, but it's pretty interesting. So anyways, he says, and when he had heard that, he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them. They kept the more silence, and he saith. So not like Isaiah 53, 7, where Christ is brought to the, you know, to the slaughter and opened not his mouth, and he was dumb. Paul says, absolutely not. I'm getting ready to absolutely blast you. Remember, Peter already did this to him in Acts 3 and 4. You remember? Acts 2, 3, 4, Peter does this. At Acts chapter number 7, Stephen absolutely lights him up. In Acts chapter number 13, the Apostle Paul blasts him again, right? And then here in Acts chapter 21, or 20, 22 here, I think this is really the last hurrah. Because after this point, it's, it's, he's in prison, and we don't really hear, you know, they're making oaths that they're swearing that they're, they're going to basically not eat or drink until they've killed Paul, you know? Acts 28, Acts 28 yeah, there's, there's a little bit there. Obviously, he says that, you know, at the very end, he, he gets in to say that, you know, I, I'm going to speak these things, but really I'm going to go to the Gentiles that that, that word will be man manifest. And he does give a little more of a, of a reprimand, but really this is what I would consider the, the, the prime, last, big, uh, if you would, their, their conviction. You know, you, you, you guys are guilty. And, and you, I was one of you, and I'm, I'm no longer like you anymore. So we've been trying to show these verses that... We are going to get there, I promise, that the James chapter 2 issue of faith of that works is dead, 
is very important to lay out foundational here in, in uh, Acts 22. Because he says this very specifically, I am verily a man, which am a Jew. So he identifies that his manliness or his flesh is Jewish in nature because of where he was born, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in the feet, brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. That describes and tells us that every single one of the people in the nation of Israel that are at this meeting here, remember he says if it by any means he could make it, so remember in chapter number uh, 19, or I'm sorry, chapter 20 and verse 16, he says if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, he wanted to be there. So what takes place at Pentecost? Everybody gathers together at Jerusalem for that temple worship. And he's specifically telling them that I was zealous like you were in coming to Jerusalem for the actual aspect of what Pentecost meant. I was that way, but now all these things I consider what? I consider it to be dung. I consider it lost for the knowledge of the excellency of Christ, right? So going on these verses, he says, I was zealous toward God as you all are this day. Now, what is the zealous nature of their, of their, their law keeping? It's self-righteousness. Let's not forget that, okay? 2120 says that they are self-righteous. They trusted in Moses. They thought that they, that they could get righteousness from the law, and it was not possible, yet they continued to go down that path. Now, he writes on to say, I was zealous toward God, as you all are this way, and I persecuted, notice, this way. Let me make them a little bit quiet. Sorry. Yeah, my ADHD kicks in, and when they start screaming, it gets a little, it's a little nuts here. He goes, and I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prison both men and women, as also the high priest does bear me witness in all the estate of elders. Very important passage. The same people that gave the Apostle Paul authority to bring them bound are still alive, okay? Start thinking about this for a second. In Acts 21, right in the very beginning, look over here at chapter 21, verse 18. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. <clears throat> what is James doing with all of the elders here in Jerusalem? What is he doing there? They like it when people scratch their back, right? You know... <clears throat> One of the quickest ways to a person's heart, and, and I shouldn't even say this because you guys are going to think I'm bad, but it's manipulation 101. It's the compliment. It's the compliment meets the ask them what they would do. You ever seen that? I got the situation. What do you think I should do? <laughs> Ooh, you think I'm smart. <laughs> you know, I've, I've had people do it to me. And I'm like, listen, I, uh, it's the oldest trick in the book. I know that one, right? But Paul's, or, or James is there because these individuals are scratching his back. They're telling him, oh, yeah, you're James. Look at you. Look at the authority that you have, right? Remember, those that came from James, they appear to be somewhat what they were and make it no difference to me because what? God accepteth no man's person. So James is specifically telling you that all the Jews which believe they're all still zealous of the law, I'm telling you right now, these guys get corrupted. This is the problem. They go, what do you mean? James was infiltrated by the, the, the apostate Jewish leaders. There's nothing in Jerusalem for them to get. They are supposed to tarry in Jerusalem until they be endued with power from on high, and then they should do what? Then they should go out and be witnesses. But here's what happens. It doesn't matter anymore what they do because their, their ministry is over. Their ministry is done. They have nothing by which to... You're done. Let me explain this a little bit more in detail. Go to the book of Romans. I've told you this, and, it, and people go, I don't really know if that makes a lot of sense because it sounds like they still have a ministry. They are, they are coupled together with the nation of Israel. And in Romans chapter number you know, 10 and in chapter number 11, specifically in 11... The nation of Israel as a whole, 
Peter, James, John, the rest of the apostles, they suffer loss for the unbelief of the nation of Israel. They suffer consequence. Well, I don't know if that's true. Okay, let's read the verses. Read what it says right here. <clears throat> I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. Do you think in what he's doing here in Acts chapter 22, he's provoking them which are of his flesh? Yes, of course. Let's just back up to 21. I'm not going to turn there. I'm just going to tell you what happens. There was rumors that in Ephesus he brought in Trophimus, who was a Greek, into the temple. They were mad about it. They polluted the place. That's making them say, that's our stuff. That's not their stuff. You're not allowed to bring them in there. And God says through Paul, well, actually, you ain't got nothing. If you want anything at this point in time, you're going to have to get it through the Apostle Paul. The answer that people have asked me and said, well, do they need to align themselves with Paul's ministry in order to continue to do the work of God? The answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. They can't, they don't, there's been a viewpoint that, well, there's two separate paths. There's these guys who are continuing down the gospel of the kingdom. They can't continue to preach the gospel of the kingdom. It, it doesn't work anymore. It does, it's not there for them. It's not going to be immediately fulfilled. It's not right before their eyes. You follow how that works? So what do they have to do? They have to recognize with what Paul says. And now Peter says that there is a kingdom that is reserved in heaven for you, right? But it's reserved. We're waiting for it. It's not here yet. We're not going to get it. Those times and the seasons which the Father hath put into his own power that is talked about really early on in the book of Acts. Remember in Acts chapter number 1 that they don't know about. Clearly, God is not going to restore again the kingdom to Israel. Do we understand that? Can, can Peter, James, and John keep saying, God's going to restore again the kingdom of Israel. Jerusalem's going to be here. No, because we already know the prophecies that were, that were quoted in Matthew 23, 24, and 25 as it relates to the, the leadership of Israel is death and destruction upon them. Yes? yes? Do we know all those passages? Do we need to look at them? Probably not. You guys know what he says in there. He says, you are not going, you know, remember he says, think, think not to say to yourselves that we had been, you know, in the days of those prophets, we would not have been partakers with them. He says, you would have been partakers with them because you're doing it right now. You prove the point that you killed, you know, you want to kill, you killed Stephen, okay? You now want to kill Saul of Tarsus, a.k.a. the Apostle Paul. And in doing that, we have no defense of Paul by any believer. You follow me? And this is why I'm telling you, there's no alignment between what they're preaching and teaching and what Paul's preaching and teaching. This is why people go, oh, you believe in Paul. <laughs> see how that works? Oh, I see what you do. You try to follow after Paul. Yes, we always follow after Paul. We, we do that because you don't, if you don't do that, the Bible doesn't make any sense. But further, the more reason why we do it is because we've been told to do that. And the ministry of the, of the, of the Jewish people is, as it says right here, it's, it's done away. Read what it says. For if the casting away of them... <laughs> What? The casting away. Yep, done. God says he's rich in mercy. He has mercy upon all. He says he's concluded the entire nation of Israel. He concluded them all in unbelief that he may have mercy upon all. So in Acts chapter 22, I want somebody to answer me this question. Why does James not defend the apostle Paul? If Paul has truth, why is he not going up and saying, no, 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 please, please, please. Paul is a fellow brother. Paul is a member of the body of Christ. Paul is a believer. Paul, meanwhile, it's what? Off with his head. It is not fit for this man to live anymore on this earth. When he says that he was standing by consenting unto the death, right, of Stephen, right? I stood by I was consenting unto his death. Roll reverse that now with James. Okay? I stood by and I was consenting unto his death. You don't think about this very often, but it's a very important part of the scripture. 
You have to see this. I am utterly convinced that that's what happens here in, in this in Acts chapter 22. You cannot be around. Remember, we just read the verses a little bit ago, a little, little bit ago in 1 Corinthians, you know, six and seven about the little leaven leaven at the whole lump. <laughs> Dude, you're the whole, you're the you're the you're you're the only little piece of maybe believing Israel remnant that's there. Yet you retain and stay inside of Jerusalem the entire time. Why would you do that? When Christ sends John the Baptist, he calls everyone out of Jerusalem for a very particular reason. And all of those religious Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, elites, elders, whatever you want to say, the, the priests, they all come out to see what was happening. And he says, what did you come to see? You know, a reed shaking in the wind? What, what are you looking for here? Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And that wrath to come is upon the nation of Israel, and it's also the tribulation. But more, more importantly and more particularly, the priestly duty that John the Baptist was doing was outside of Jerusalem. You follow me? It's outside of the temple. So for somebody to say, oh, you can, you can confess your sins in the Jordan, that sounds crazy. What do you mean you can confess your sins in the Jordan? You can't confess your sins until the priest does the sacrifice that is necessary for you for your cleansing. And they're saying, no, no, we actually do this a different way. You're going to come out here. You're going to confess your sins. We're going to baptize you in this water right now. And we're going to sanctify and separate you from those people. So how many years go by <laughs> between what we're seeing here in the very beginning of Acts and in Acts chapter, you know, 22? Decades. Think about it. Decades goes by. So now we have decades that have gone by. What's happening? The prophecies are being completely fulfilled. They're a disobedient and gainsaying people. They constantly rejected Christ. They never had a conversion of the entire nation of Israel. That is why God did what? Read the verse again. For if the casting away of them. <laughs> what does it mean to cast away? I filleted my fish last night when I was cleaning it up, and there are pieces of the fish you don't want to eat. I promise you. When I'm cleaning it up, there's like, just like when you're cleaning a pig, you know, there's silver skin. There's stuff. Don't eat that. It's gross. Most people wouldn't necessarily think it's that bad, but yeah, it's, it's, it's chewy. It's kind of nasty. There's certain pieces you don't want to eat. And what do you do with that? You cast it away. <laughs> But when I'm casting that away, I'm keeping a nice little piece of meat that's, you know, going to be good. So what God does with the nation of Israel is he casts them away, but he says, listen, you can come back in and you can be grafted back in. That's what he gets into this whole issue in Romans chapter 11, this whole spiritual issue. You can partake back in that which, which, which was yours from the very beginning. It's why in Romans chapter 15, while the Apostle Paul says, we... As meaning Gentiles, we, I mean, he's concluding himself, he goes, we should be partakers of the carnal, of the, we should be helpers of the carnal things of the nation of Israel when we have been made partakers of their spiritual things. Eternal life, not the mystery, right? Gentile salvation, not the mystery. The kingdom, not the mystery. What are the portions of the mystery? This is what's very interesting, because people will say the body of Christ, which is true. Though, what we have to understand is it's, Paul says a phrase like the, in, in the book of Ephesians that you've been made, made fellow partakers in of one body, right, which is Christ. So they partake in the body, but not in the body of Christ. That's where it gets like, well, uh, what's the difference between the body and the body of Christ? Well, obviously, you know, Christ says, this is my body, which is broken for you. So it is definitely uh, the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is for both the Jew and the Gentile. But we read what Paul says in Romans chapter number one, that, that uh, um, is the gospel, the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth to the, to the Jew first, and then also to the Greek, which is completely clear in the scripture. You see that over and over and over again. So now today, are we preaching anything to Jew first? No, of course not. We're preaching, you know, Jew and Gentile without distinction. There's no difference. We just, we just keep going on. But this issue of casting away of them, whenever the nation of Israel is punished, I have many sermons on smite the shepherd, you know, scatter the sheep. Uh, you guys are, probably can look up that. And, and, and so when you start smiting the shepherd, 
you you smite Christ, and what happens? Sheep go out. So the separation that the apostles should have done early on was you're going to tarry in Jerusalem until you begin to do with power from on high. Okay? You're going to work through that process of convincing through Pentecost in Acts chapter number 2, all of you in the belief of Jesus is the Christ, <clears throat> ye with wicked hands have crucified and slain the coming of the just one. Right? You men of, you men of Israel, right? Jesus Christ of Nazareth, a man approved among you by miracles, wonders, and signs which he did in the midst of you, which yourselves also know. Right? You guys all know about this. Now you've seen the resurrection. Now you're seeing the witnessing of it. As many as the prophets have spoken from Joel and after, they have likewise foretold of these days. Repent, right? Be baptized. Believe the gospel. We have work to do. We need to go evangelize the known world, right? In Jerusalem, that's where they were doing all this. Remember? This was all taking place in Jerusalem because they are to tarry in Jerusalem. In Romans chapter 11, verse number 15, it says, For the casting away of them. Where were they cast away? From their position or their, uh, their, their, their hierarchy, if you would, as being the people of God. They're not the people of God anymore. And this is, this is, this is the hard part that people understand. You know, there's a, there's a thing called Jews for Jesus. You guys heard that one before? What is that? That doesn't make any sense. Jews for Jesus? Well, you can't be a Jew. And you can't be for Jesus. If you're, if you're saying you're a Jew for Jesus, you're missing the point, right? You're not even a Jew. You can't even tell me your lineage if you tried. You couldn't even get, you know, we did the, uh, the, the lineage, lineage thing, genealogy thing. My mom did it. And we got, I don't know how many generations back. It wasn't that many. Let's say it was eight or ten, I think, something like that. That's as far back as my mom could take us. And I... I promise you, it was pretty ridiculous. My mom and I and my parents, we, 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 got, we got in the minivan, or the, uh, not the minivan, we had a uh, station wagon. We got in the back of the station wagon, and we're driving to, like, graveyards in Pennsylvania. My mom's trying to find tombstones to try to match this stuff up. I'm talking the wackiest things you've ever seen. And we're driving around, and I remember my... My, my parents are like, okay, we got to look for these things. And I'm walking, and my dad's like, you'll walk there. And I'm like, what? He's like, that's the tombstone. You walk through the thing. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like a 10-year-old kid. I'm just walking around, you know? I'm like, you, you, you're traping us all around the world to try to find this information. And never forget, we get to this guy's house. It's my mom's, you know, third cousin, once removed, second stepbrother's nephew's uncle's cousin. You know, we get to some guy's house. And we show up, and it's a trailer. You know, it's like a legit, like, double-wide trailer. And uh, we walk in, and it's just disgusting as everything. And I'm like, what? Are we dying in this place? I mean, this is scary. I, I mean, I remember just going, we got to get out of here. And I was probably 10 to 12, something like that. And we walk in the house, and the guy's like, yeah, I got, I got a newspaper from the day that did do to do And he's opening up the newspaper from the obituary from the such and such. And my mom's making all these connections. I mean, dude, what is she, like Carmen San Diego? I mean, it was like, she's over there doing whatever. So, you know, that was extensive, extensive, you know, looking at the, at the, at the you know, genealogical pieces. Back in their day, they could tell you with specificity what tribe they were from, right? Paul calls them the endless genealogies which do gender stripes, right? Why are they gendering strife? Because a Jew's coming up and telling you, I'm a Jew and you're Ned. <laughs> they were doing that. That's what they were actually doing. They were coming up and saying, they I'm, they still, this is what, you just, you just took the words out of my mouth. That's what Jews for Jesus does. We're better than you because we're a Jew for Jesus. What? You see how that works? We're really God's chosen people. And then, you know, conservative fundamental America, you know, they, 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 they do the same thing. Israel, 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 worship Israel, got to do this whole thing. What? Where are you guys getting this crazy stuff from? You know, it's pretty, pretty wackadoodle, right? So if you read this, what he's saying here, and for the casting away of them being the reconciling of the world. So the world gets reconciled by Israel being cast away. Uh-oh. Who's going to do the ministry? Oh, ding, ding, ding. Q, Apostle Paul, right? 
so the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, were graft in among them, and with them partakers of the root and of the fatness of the olive tree, and this is where people start to get really weird, where they start to go, see, now you're Israel. No, this is all the spiritual things, the foundation of the prophets and the spirit. Like, go to the book of Ephesians for a second. Look at me with these verses. <clears throat> go to, look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. What is your citizenship? Is it, I'm now an Israelite. My citizenship's Israel. No. Answer is no. You see how this works? My citizenship is not that. I, my citizenship is, as he says here, but with the fellow citizens, with the saints, and the household of God. Your citizenship now is because of the adoption by which God placed you into his heavenly family through Christ Jesus. So now, finishing out this verse, he says, and are built, though. Notice this. This is the important part. This is that, this is that fatness when people go like, well, the, the, the olive tree. and the, the, the. you got to remember, I talk to, I've talked to so many people about the craziest stuff, and I'm like, dude, you just read a John MacArthur book one time, and then you're like, this is my doctrine. I, I'm rolling with it. But you've never spent even five minutes on your own time. You just read a book. I had a guy just recently asked me, I want to get a book that I can learn more about the Bible. I'm like, yeah, it's called the Bible. <laughs> no, seriously, I, I can show you the text message. He literally sent me a text saying, I want to get a book where I can learn more about the Bible. And I go, dude, and my mind gets blown because I'm like, dude, just read the Bible. You don't, you don't need to get a book to read the Bible. Just, just, just read it. Like, actually study it. Just keep reading it over and over again. This is true. So when, you, when he says, you know, partakers of the root and of the fatness of the olive tree, the root and the fatness, as he says here, this is what it is. Notice this. And built upon the foundation, the foundation, the root, right? What is that root? Listen, the, the story of Jesus Christ without the apostles, right? With, without the prophets, you have to have that. It's an important part of the story. You have to have the prophets, because that's what proves all of that, that truthfulness of God throughout generation to generation to generation to generation. You have God proving himself to be faithful in the keeping of his word. So you're built upon the foundation of the prophets. You're built upon the uh, foundation of the apostles. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Notice this. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. So where is the temple today? Not in Israel, it's not in Jerusalem. Where was the temple in Acts chapter 22? Not in Jerusalem. God is not even remotely interested in whatever happens there in Acts chapter 22 in that crazy temple. He doesn't care. When they're shaving their heads and doing vows and doing sacrifices, doing all this Passover stuff, he's going, dude, you guys are missing what's going on. You're missing the point. They had to align themselves with the Apostle Paul. So in Acts chapter number 22, going back over to these verses, <clears throat> in verse number 5, he says, I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. What is this way? It's the John 14, 6. It's the Jesus Christ way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. As also the high priest does bear me witness very important part of this passage that the same people that the apostle Paul was given the authority to bring people bound back to Jerusalem to persecute are the same people that he's now preaching against saying I was wrong Jesus is the Messiah and all of the estate of elders from whom I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus Notice what he says here. I receive letters unto the brethren after the flesh. This authority that he has to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. 
And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, <clears throat> suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me, and I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid. But they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise, go into Damascus, and there it shall be told, of, told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. I want to compare this to Acts chapter number 11, please. Peter, in Acts chapter number 11, speaks to Christ, gets the multiple visions about the cleanliness of the Gentiles. And in Acts chapter number 11, in verse number 1, it says, The apostles and brethren which were in Judea, okay, Jerusalem is included in Judea, okay? Just think about, let's say, Clearwater is the central city of Pinellas, or St. Pete is, and then, you know, Pinellas is the county, okay? So Judea being the county, he says, They were in Judea, heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to where? comes up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision did what? Contended. Contended with him. Saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning, and expounded it by order unto them, saying, right? So now he goes through this whole order, and he gets down to the very end here, in verse number uh, uh, 14, where he says, uh, Who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and thy house shall be saved? And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how he said that John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they said, It is not fit that a fellow should live. No, actually, it doesn't, doesn't say that. Can you read this again? He says this, For as much then that God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? And they said, This is a, this is a pestilent fellow. Now, those are all the things they said about who? They said about Saul Tarsus. They said about Paul. In this passage, look what it writes. This is 20 years before. He says, When they heard these things, they did what? held their peace. And they glorified God, saying, Then, then, then hath God also to the Gentiles grant repentance unto life. Okay, so what changes in that period of time? What changes in between this, this, this 20 years? The evil men, the seducers, they wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Who are they even deceiving? Um, guy's name's James. Look at this passage with me. Go back to, go back to Acts. Look at twenty-two again. And when I could not see for the glory of the light, being led by the hand of them <clears throat> that were with me, I came into Damascus, and in one hand and I, as a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see the just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be witnesses unto, unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now, why tarest thou? Arise, and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it came to pass, when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, and saw him saying unto me, Make haste, and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem. For they will not receive whose testimony? You're a traitor. You're a traitor, Saul. You're, you, tr you, you, you went to the other side. You see why that was so important when they received Peter's testimony, but they did not receive Paul's testimony? Because now he's saying, you were one of us, and now you're saying that you're no longer one of us. Now you're saying that we're all wrong, and we're all unrighteous, and we're all going to hell. Uh, you're saying that to yourselves, because you know. 
We'll finish off with these last two verses. He says, and, and, I, and I said, Lord, they know that I am prisoned and beat in every synagogue, them that believed on thee. And when the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Do you see what's making them really mad? The prophecy that they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. The prophecy that he's saying, you are going to have to go to the Gentiles because I'm casting away the nation of Israel and they want nothing to do with me. But me, God, who am rich in mercy, I will conclude them all in unbelief that I can have mercy upon all. And they're going to have to come through the Gentiles if they want to get salvation. Wow. Wow. Now, at this point, you would think that they would hold their peace like they did in Acts chapter 11. you think, just like with Peter, they would go, Peter, wow, then God hath granted to the Gentiles repentance unto life. What do they say in here in chapter number 22? And when they gave audience unto his word, they lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. That's pretty wild. <laughs> I've never heard this stuff preached in the, you know, 20 something years I was in church. And it's sad that it's, it's sad that's the case. Because these passages of scripture, these verses that you're getting, you are getting such a contextual understanding of what's going on that it's it provides you with, you know what it is? Let me tell you. It provides you with faith. People go, how do, I, how do I increase my faith? How can I get more faith in this world? We have to have the scripture by which you believe. So as you study these verses out, it, it just becomes more increasingly convincing of the word of God by which I believe, and then increases my faith. And guess what I do when you have more faith? When your faith abounds, you know what happens? You have more hope, you have more peace, you have a better life. So we'll leave with that, and uh, let's close in prayer.